Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Corporate Tax Changes for Oil and Gas Company Valuations. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Before we get started, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Jim Harden. And Jim is a partner and central region valuation leader at Moss Adams. In his 34-year career, he has led hundreds of oil and gas valuation engagements in North and South America, Africa, Russia, Eastern and Western Europe, Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Jim's work has supported mergers and acquisitions, SEC and IFRS financial reporting, federal and international tax matters, insurance, bankruptcy, solvency, and expert witness and litigation support purposes. His clients have included major and independent oil and gas companies, midstream operators and MLPs, oil refiners, royalty trusts, global drillers, and oil field service companies. Jim has served energy clients as an expert witness several times before courts in Delaware, Texas, Oklahoma, and Colorado on matters ranging from bankruptcies and insolvencies to deal damages. His professional experience includes serving as the global oil and gas valuation leader at a big four accounting firm. Early in his career, he worked at Texaco and was a partner at a reserve consulting practice as well as co-owner of an oil and gas exploration and production company. Jim has dual BS degrees from Fort Hayes State University and an MBA from Letourneau University. He is a senior member of the American Society of Appraisers a certified professional geologist, and a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, the Society of Economic Geologists, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He has presented papers at more than 40 professional conferences and has been published by the Society of P Petroleum Engineers, the Oil and Gas Financial Journal, Entercom, and other professional publications, and has been named by the Houston Business Journal and the American Cities Business Journals as a who's who in energy. And with that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks, Emily. I, 
I was hoping you'd read my whole resume. <laughs> anyway, uh, we we appreciate everyone's attendance here, and, and the, the purpose of this is to talk about uh, uh, why why do you need valuations on oil and gas for tax purposes. We're, we'll talk a little bit about the guidance on valuation methods by the IRS, as well as uh, walk through a, a valuation performed for tax purposes and uh, some of the state tax considerations. And as well, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, the, the new tax change in the federal tax code. And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the effects on value there. And as uh, was stated earlier, if you have any questions, uh, there is a uh, uh, Q&A, and don't, don't hesitate to ask, and we can uh, follow up on those uh, at the end of the conversation. Anyway, so <clears throat> basically, uh, the tax recovery for upstream assets is, is the depletable and depreciable. Uh, the reserves are depletable and the leasehold equipment and those other costs are what are depreciable costs. Uh, interestingly about depletable, the IRS has a different uh, look on reserves than the SEC. So for book accounting purposes, uh, life would be over proved reserves only, but for tax purposes, it can actually, it's, it's defined as resource. And so a proved reserve life might only be uh, 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, but total resource life can be as long as 30 or 40 years. So for tax purposes, there is, there is a differentiation between uh, tax and book. Uh, so you can have a uh, longer depletable life for tax than you uh, could actually show for book purposes, which once again are only proved reserves. So it would, it's not uncommon to see, particularly in some of the bigger shale plays, the gas plays, Marcellus or otherwise, where uh, for tax purposes you're going to have a, a depletable basis uh, 30, 40 years, and I've seen it even, even longer than that. The tangible equipment, though, is uh, taxed on a seven-year maker's. And uh, that's an accelerated schedule where you get a lot of write-off in the first three years and then tapering down uh, less than that. So at the, <clears throat> if you owned a property for 10 years, you could, you could have uh, uh, a, a, at the end of seven years nothing but reserves left to deplete on a much longer life than you would for, from uh, the, the front end, which would include the, the quicker depreciation on the equipment. Uh, with the new tax change, there's a 100% bonus currently available on new and used equipment, but that phases out after five years. So by 2023, uh, it begins phasing down, <clears throat> and by 2026, uh, it's down to 20%. So uh, that's something to consider if you're looking at acquisitions. The... Um, there can be 15-year makers in certain instances, but for uh, for general purposes, other than buildings and uh, uh, those types of improvements, which would be a 39-year life, uh, it's all going to be a seven-year life. Midstream assets uh, for any any MLPs listening in, uh, seven years. Uh, in, in most instances, but uh, again, the bonus depreciation with the new tax change is available on new and used, used equipment. And that was kind of the big change in the tax law on the bonus depreciation. Uh, previously, you would only get the bonus depreciation on new equipment. With the new tax law, you get it on used as well. So uh, when you come into the door on properties, uh, that uh, bonus equip bonus depreciation, pardon me, is available on all leasehold tangible property, such as the facilities, pipelines, compression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, <clears throat> one one other thing we have seen in upstream allocations, and this is uh, at, at the bottom of the page we're on now, acquired customer contracts. Uh, those those are deemed Section 197 assets and are depreciated over a, just on a straight line for 15 years. 
And uh, interestingly, we, we see lots of E&P deals, upstream deals, that have uh, elements of intangible assets, and that could be uh, volumetric deficiency contracts or above market type of contracts that have to be booked as an intangible asset. And uh, lots of times those aren't carved out or thought about on the, on the front end of a deal, but once you get into them, there can be a, a, a volumetric or otherwise contract that uh, needs to be carved out and valued uh, discreetly away from the reserves or the equipment. Okay, so uh, the guidance behind this, and I, I don't know how many people are, are uh, all that interested in uh, uh, the Treasury regs, but the Internal Revenue Service has a manual uh, referred to as the IRM, and it's a market segment specialization program specifically made for their use and third-party use and, and for training purposes uh, for their agents and engineers and uh, uh, it, it's available <clears throat> you can you can look that reg up uh, actually the manual up uh, 4.41 and it, it, it goes through cost depletion percentage depletion it's about a 60 or 80 page uh, manual and but, but goes into a whole lot of detail and that that's what the IRS engineers lean on when they're performing audits and reviews in the oil and gas sector it's uh it, it, I, <laughs> as they say it's worth a read but it's certainly uh worth a reference point it has a lot of uh a lot of information and uh it kind of gives you a, a an idea of what they're looking for when they come knocking and look at your last deal or look at your your records. <clears throat> but the uh, uh, the particular guidance I'm showing you here is uh, states that when a producing property is purchased, the price has to be allocated between the leasehold and the equipment. The cost base is allocated between the leasehold and equipment in proportion to their fair market value. And, and basically, what that's saying is you have to do an allocation, and a lot of people forget about that. And, and if you're working through purchase sale agreements, you'll, you'll see something called the Form 8594. And the 8594 election sets forth the 1060 allocation. And IRC 1060 is the allocation of the purchase price through their various asset classes. On asset deals, is what are most typical in oil and gas, uh, there's, there's usually only one asset class, and that's class five assets, which is the includes both equipment and reserves. Like I uh, said a bit ago, there's, there's sometimes an intangible element. If there are contracts that go along with the acquisition that uh, uh, fall into the class six bucket or intangible bucket, and Occasionally, we have seen, um, and mostly in the past couple of years, uh, even some goodwill. And this can be negative good, goodwill or, or uh, typical goodwill. In other words, uh, negative goodwill would be uh, uh, where, whereby you could receive a bargain purchase on an asset. And uh, we haven't been uh, countered on that any. Uh, we have had uh, discussions with SEC on that matter, but for tax purposes, uh, negative goodwill is typically an, a non-factor because most of the assets and most of the value is all going to be pushed into that purchase price for tax purposes. Treasury Reg 1.61, and, and, and this is interesting, uh, the cost or comparative sales approach should be used before a discounted cash flow analysis, and having testified if uh, many occasions and uh, gone before the IRS defending clients. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, the IRS looks at a comparable transaction approach as more relevant uh, across the board than they would a cash flow analysis. And, and we all know that 98% uh, of uh, oil and gas properties are bought and sold using discounted cash flow analysis. We know it's widely regarded and accepted as, as the common and standard way within our industry. But if you ever get in trouble, you need to have a backstop 
of uh, transaction analysis. So we, we, we provide that in just, just to show the reasonableness from a, a comparative uh, sales approach. And, and part of that is, uh, has been driven by uh, the legal part of our business. Uh, in, as, as a judge uh, is, is more likely to say, yeah, what what is this cash flow analysis, and and uh, what's the discount rate, and and all the things that that we take for granted, they're more likely to say, well, it makes sense. It's something across the street or across the road or down the road sold for uh, X, and so your property is worth X as well. <clears throat> okay, so we have a polling question here. All right. And the question our first oh, our first polling question. Uh, when possible, which methods do the IRS prefer to be used when valu valuing oil and gas reserves? And your options are income and cost approach, transaction and cost approach, transaction and income approach, or all three methods. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond to participate. Please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. I'll give everyone a few more moments to make a selection. And let's take a look at the results. Jim, back to you. All right, so when possible, which methods does the IRS prefer? Uh, <clears throat> And and that that's kind of a that's kind of a trick question, but I, as I just showed you, they prefer the transaction and the cost approach, which uh twenty six percent of the people this was this was very evenly spread. Uh income and cost approach was seventeen percent, uh transaction and cost approach twenty one percent of the audience, uh transaction and income twenty six, and all three methods uh thirty. And, and the, the strict answer is uh, number two, the transaction and cost approach. But the reality is uh, when, when the service is looking at valuations, they like to see all approaches. And, and some of you are probably scratching your head and saying, well, how can you have a cost approach on an oil and gas asset or a mining asset or otherwise? And uh, <clears throat> that's a good question because it's not really relevant. But in the valuations, you have to say it was considered, but not con not uh, not used because it you know is is for the most part irrelevant in that nature. So uh, uh, this this interesting poll we got uh, answers all across the board. Uh, one one thing I want to to bring up and talk a little bit about is the valuation methodology and and mind you we have we have seen uh, a lot of different uh, I'll just say types of analysis uh, in in our daily work here and uh, uh, we we've seen some things that are so sophisticated that we have a hard time understanding and some things that are pretty big that are very, very unsophisticated. But at the end of the day, the valuation comes down to, you know, you're, you're trying to estimate the reserves and the economic potential of, of what you're buying. And so, as I tell people, you know, reserve estimation is the most important step. And when uh, when when we run, you know, Monte Carlos for some people and this and that, and you come out to a tornado chart and says, what are the key value drivers of an oil and gas deal? Uh, usually about 60% or more of the deal is actually uh, uh, tilted toward the reserves themselves and the production and the flow rates and the life of the, of the reserves, you know, and then obviously price is a big driver and expenses, capex and, and discount rate and so on and so forth. But people buy uh, reserves uh, and, and do oil and gas deals for the reserves and the production profile that they're, they're getting. And so <clears throat> I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, uh, decline curves. And, and we all see them. The, the, the estimation, though, is, as you see, it's, it's used three steps, decline curves or, or I'll say type curves, volumetrics, which is the 
uh, physical characteristics and uh, materials balance. So let's let's talk just a little bit about uh, decline curves. And we, a lot of the stuff we see is based upon type curves. And so when, when uh, you get a reserve report, it says, uh, well, uh, if it's a very mature property and estimates can be made, that, that's great. Uh, uh, type or decline curves are good. We'll take the historical production for that particular lease or group of leases and decline those out. And much, many of the deals going on now, it, it requires more of a type curve. And, and you know, for example, we'll see a uh, uh, something in the Permian from a zone uh, B or C or Wolf Campion that, that could be 60 miles away that's being used, a type curve from that being used on the subject property. And, and it, it I guess the thing to, to remember is, you know, type curves are theoretical. They they can be vastly different in the same basin. And decline curve analysis is, is basically uh, meant to reflect a turn on and stay on approach where the wells produce the capacity over its entire life. And type curves tend to be more accurate than decline curves for a couple of reasons. One, they use actual physical characteristics measured from the reservoir to estimate that future production. And they can take into account uh, characteristics such as porosity, drainage area, fracture length, width, uh, viscosity, uh, to get a more precise production forecast. And, and as well, the, uh, the type curve uh, analysis allows for changes in well management strategy, and that could be choke size or wellhead pressure, shutting in wells. Uh, things of that that respect, and and as changes are made within a field, a new type curve that reflects that new behavior of the well is found and and used to forecast that production profile, and and as and as well, it it considers you know a constant flow state. In other words, when initially when a well is put in production, the gas in the reservoir exhibits what what's called the transient flow, which means the change in fluid in the reservoir is neither zero nor constant. And, and the reason for that is the existence of an open well and extraction of the, of the gas or the fluids hasn't been affected in the entire reservoir. And, and it, it's kind of like uh, uh, the gas molecules or liquid molecules are, are cars at a busy stoplight. And, and the light turns green, but it takes, takes a, a period of time for the traffic to all get through the light to reach that steady state flow at the intersection, which, you know, we hope is a speed limit. But anyway, for, for a decline curve analysis to be valid, you have, you have to wait until the fluid flow in the reservoir has reached that speed limit. And it, it's kind of a, a pseudo-steady flow, but uh, kind, of, kind of think of a reservoir as, as elastic, you know, like a rubber band. And it takes a while to get there, but once it begins to flow, then uh, you have what reached what is that steady state. And, and as well, then the stable production of capacity, and and that's that's decline curve analysis assumes that the you know initial period of the well is produced in a stable manner, and we all that you know that doesn't happen. I, I don't know how many of you ever <clears throat> looked up in the Bakken, but they have a winter that lost, lasts about as long as as a Houston summer, and uh, they they production goes down. You know, uh, lines freeze, compressors have issues, and so on and so forth uh, in certain areas where uh, uh, it could be mechanical types of, of issues that happen. And then uh, the decline curve also assumes that, uh, you know, you're in a constant production mechanism. And it's only valid if that production mechanism remains the same over the life of the well. And that would assume no infield drilling, uh, uh, fluid injection, uh, e.g. through a, a water flood or otherwise, or, or additional fracturing takes place during life of the well. And, and I think uh, uh, we, a lot of the people on the call have seen that. Uh, it, the, the, the most classic example is, is the Barnett Shale, where by uh, when, when it was uh, discovered, you know, I say discovered when it was heavily drilled out, uh, 10, 15 years ago or more, uh, <clears throat> we, a, a, a type curl, curve was, was an admirable way to look at it. And now we've realized over time that, that uh, uh, refracking 
uh, with new technology can bring those wells into a different state and uh, recoveries are beyond those which were uh, originally, I'll, I'll say, analyzed. So, um, you know, production forecast uh, and, and that, that little diatribe I talked about uh, here about type curves and, and, and decline curves, uh, it, it's got to be sound and logical or uh, we tend to uh, look at that uh, it, it, particularly in newer horizons and uh, determine whether or not more reserve risk or risk adjustment factors, RAFs, are, are required and, and that can even be on, on PDP because, you know, once again, uh, decline curves are looking at reserves from a turn on and stay on type of approach and oft times don't uh, include uh, uh, new wells in the field, uh, lack of pressure or otherwise, and once you get enough pressure uh, reading, then uh, it, it can often be more accurate to move into more of a materials balance where you're measuring, and this would be on gas, for example, where you're measuring uh, production rate versus pressure drop, and you can get a more accurate measure of, uh, of actual reserves. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, the, the financial portion of the cash flow analysis is all moot if you are not forecasting the correct reserves. So moving into discounted cash flow uh, in, involves five or six steps, obviously, projection of those production volumes in the reserves, uh, forecast of commodity prices, which uh, good luck, uh, we've all made uh, per perhaps grim errors in trying to project or forecast commodity prices. And uh, uh, right now people are in a, in a state that, uh, of, I'll just say, uh, optimism. Uh, when I'm on the streets in the day, people are excited. Oil is approaching $70, and there was an article the other day about uh, uh, somebody saying by end of year we're going to be in the $80 range. And, uh, you know, well, nobody saw that two years ago. There were many prognosticators that thought we would be in uh, a $40 state two years ago. And here we are uh, in, in the high 60s. And... Uh, a lot of enthusiasm and upside. The other thing that needs to be projected is obviously operating costs and capex, and uh, that that can be uh, well, it, it's almost invariably lease or well specific. Uh, if it's a turn on and stay on, well, then then that that's fine. Uh, monthly forecasts of of uh, operating costs, but if there are capex requirements such as refracts or tree acid tr treatments or otherwise that need to be built into the discounted cash flow. Uh, and, and then I mentioned a bit ago reserve risk by category, and, and I like to lean on the old SBWE survey. I don't know how many of the uh, people on this call have, have looked at it, but it's certainly worth a look. And it's a it's an annual survey, the SPWE, which Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers performs. They reach out to a lot of bankers. They reach out to a lot of private equities and companies and uh, usually get somewhere between 100 and 200 uh, qualified respondents and uh, asking them about methodology that uh, you go through when valuing oil and gas, what type of uh, reserve risk is included, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, that, that obviously comes back, uh, you know, proved reserves, you know, almost, you know, proved producing reserves, uh, zero to maybe 5% risk, and I'll, I'll say from a, a, a P90 perspective, uh, down to, when looking at PUDs, it could be as much as 50% risk, usually depending upon the reservoir, uh, from uh, 25 to 45% risk, and so on and so forth. But I think we all know on the call that people are having a hard time today paying anything for possible reserves or probable reserves. Almost, uh, uh, you know, 90, 90 plus percent of the value is is through the proved reserves and with most of that uh, being on proved 
producing. And then <clears throat> further down, uh, is selecting the appropriate discount rates uh, that satisfies the weighted average cost of capital and any additional risk. And we'll talk a little bit more about that now. Uh, finally, the transaction approach. You probably all on the call are very aware of the, the multiples that are out there, and, and, and they vary widely by region, whether you're in West Texas or the Eagleford or the Marcellus Shale or the DJ Basin or uh, mid-continent uh, selected pockets. And, and it's typically measured in a dollars per barrel of recoverable reserves. So if you had a, had a million barrels of reserves and you saw that uh, uh, and had enough information to see that uh, deals in this area are selling for $6 a barrel, well, you could say, well, you know, uh, a production like this so it would be worth $6 million or so on and so forth. A, Kind of a, 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 a more recent uh, way, and when I say more recent, the past few years, people are looking at it from a dollars per net daily producing barrel, and that'd be net. So if you're if you had a 70% uh, net revenue interest lease or 75, and uh, uh, production in that area was selling for you know thirty thousand dollars a barrel, uh, your net your net interest of that times $30,000 a barrel would give you an approximation of, of uh, uh, fair value. Royalties and overrides, uh, typically you look at, uh, at the end of the day, the rule of thumb is monthly revenue multiples. And um, we also decline them and run discounted cash flow. But uh, uh, if, if I see uh, royalties are selling for uh, you know, 120 months in in uh, certain parts of, of Texas, and my discounted cash flow comes up with uh, uh, something around 200 months. I say, well, heck, I, you know, got a problem here. Or if, if uh, conversely, if if I run a cash flow analysis and and see that, uh, hey, I'm going to put a bid in for something, and and I think we can buy it for 60 months. Or, probably smoking something because uh, people that buy royalties and overrides really like those rules of thumb. And then obviously dollars per acre. Mention that here. So uh, back to the decline curves, just want to, to run through that real quickly. And I think uh, I'm, it, it's, it's a little blurry for me to see, so I'm going to have to refer to a paper copy here. But the uh, uh, what, what we're looking at here is just a standard rate versus time uh, decline curve. Uh, I generated that, and that's that's in Colorado, and and that uh, appears to be about 60 wells that uh, were mostly drilled out in 2010, 11, and 12, and uh, uh, obviously there was something happened in 2017 because there's a large jump in the production. But most assuredly, it will fall back uh, to that same production profile that it exhibited in the first five or six years. This is an example of a new field decline. Uh, this is in Reeves, Texas. And uh, uh, there's we put a hyperbolic curve on this to estimate the reserves on it. But if you look at that peak production and go back about three years to 2014 and 13, you'll see where uh, the production climbed and then quickly fell back. So by adding new wells, it is likely going to follow the same production pattern that it had exhibited early on. <clears throat> now, there's two basic types of decline curves. One is an exponential decline, which is, you know, hey, it's declining at 7% or 10% year over year over year. This is a good example of the Jonah field in Wyoming. And it's a very, very large field. And, and uh, I can't tell on here about 3,000 wells, it looks like, that have been drilled for, for the past two or three decades. And uh, this is on a pretty steady state decline. 
This is exponential. Now here is a hyperbolic decline on this. Now this is a very low bow, which would have a, a very low point B factor, which describes the shape of the curve. But what's interesting about this is using an exponential decline, it's showing reserves of about 1.6, I believe. I have a hard time reading that. PCF. Uh, and using a hyperbolic, the reserve jumps to over 2 TCF. So that makes a huge difference, e.g., going back to the shape of the curve. And I, I don't like to beleaguer this too much, but it's, it's really important to understand the shape of the curve and the production outlook. And just a simple bow can add, you know, like on this, over a, a 20, 20 some percent. Uh, um, difference in, in the production profile. So it needs to be carefully analyzed by engineers and geologists. Here's type curve in the Niobrara. Uh, the only reason I like, I wanted to just show this, it kind of gives an idea of what happens when you quit drilling. So production climbs and climbs and climbs, and then uh, once drilling activities stop, uh, certain fields are going to fall and and you know we we all know that uh, what's going on in west texas and and it, it's probably not uh i'll say going to be resilient forever certainly in the discrete few years but when you quit drilling stuff stuff falls off all right so so moving into discounted cash flow analysis uh as, as we talked about earlier, it's the primary method of valuing for oil and gas, and uh, it involves discounting future incomes, which is the production times the revenue bank and less expenses and capex back to a present worth. And the key value drivers, obviously, as we talked about, are the forecasted and risk-adjusted oil and gas reserves, the net revenue interest, commodity prices, uh, projected capex and opex, future ARO and all discounting it back at a specific discount rate. So we'll talk just a little bit about discount rates. And I know I'm not going <clears> to <throat> go go in formulaically to it, but uh, uh, not everything is a PV10. And PV10 is nothing but an accounting mechanism put forth by the SEC to uh, basically normalize companies' reporting of reserves. And so uh, you can't Again, to guess how many times somebody said, well, it's worth this because the PV10 says so. And I don't know if you have uh, uh, ever ever looked at uh, reserves in, in different types of basins that uh, PV10 is just not uh, the correct discount rate. And that's uh, relevant for several things, it, either the size of the company, uh, the risk of the reserves, uh, the mechanical or operational risk, which can be a, a plenty, uh, or the geopolitical risk if you're looking outside the United States. And then to complicate that a little more, uh, the discount rate can either be pre or post tax. So uh, what I've done, what I've done, and we, we look at this rather carefully, is uh, you know trying to measure the cost of equity and the cost of capital for various uh, companies of various size, and so. Uh, one way to look at this WAC, weighted average cost capital, is over time. So what's the cost of equity done over the past seven or eight years? And tracking it through 2010, uh, when oil prices were coming back up, they were, they were relatively low after 2008 and 9, then came back up in that 60 range and moved up over time. Uh, you see the cost of equity was low lower than it is today. And this is a large independent ENPs uh, of around 12% and then has climbed steadily over time. And that's caused by a couple of things. One, companies at uh, uh, $50 oil or $60 oil aren't as big and valuable because this is all public data of SEC registrants as they once were. Some companies size in, well, some companies have bankrupted and some are much smaller now for various reasons. 
than they are today. The other is calculating this through a weighted a or through a capital asset pricing model, which accounts for uh, volatility in the beta. In other words, people are buying and selling this a lot more than they would a, a regulated public utility. So that's going to create a higher cost of equity. So the cost of equity now covers somewhere between 16 and 18 percent for the selected companies in this, which was oh, 20 or 30 companies that we called large on this. Uh, the cost of capital, though, interestingly, on the, the right-hand side of the, the page, uh, shows it still hovering around 10 percent, through thick and thin, I'll say. And that has a lot to do with the cost of debt as well as the capital structure, because on this next page, you'll see the debt equity ratio. Even though your cost of equity has climbed, uh, if your debt still, well, I'll say today it's, you know, as high as, as uh, uh, eight or even ten percent on on just just uh, uh, base debt, but MES is a lot higher now uh, because the the composition of your balance sheet has has switched from maybe low debt uh, to high debt, and you have less equity on your balance sheet, and the debt is more glaring, and much of your cost of capital, your weighted average cost capital is going to be uh, debt related, keeping your weighted average cost of capital uh, relatively stable and static. Okay, just just quickly, uh, uh, 2017 effective tax rates for E&P companies, uh, you see small, which are less than 500 million, and these again are all publicly traded. Uh, the average is, is, was about 26% in the major companies at about uh, over 40% in large companies over 40% for their effective tax rates last year. That's changing. So when we perform a discounted kind of cash flow analysis, we look at it from a couple of different ways. Usually reserve reports, if we get them from other companies, are going to be, uh, you know, PB10, and they will be performed uh, pre-tax. Now, they'll have severance tax or state and local taxes built into it, but typically, very rarely do we see uh, post-federal tax built into a reserve report. We have a different answer here. This pre particular pre-tax WAC for these companies is 11%. When we look at a post-tax WAC, and uh, using the new 21% tax rate, it uh, changes. Yeah, post-tax WAC is at 10 percent. So running the cash flow post-tax, which we do for federal tax purposes, uh, we include the depreciation, the depletion, and the amortization effect on reserves. And in this case, uh, it's around 30 million dollars. <throat> This includes a depreciation bonus of about 15%. And uh, the depreciation bonus is, uh, uh, per Section 611 of the ARC code, it's a de de depletion deduction available to owners or operators of mineral properties for, for these income tax purposes, calculated on either depreciation or the depletion method, which results in a higher deduction amount. So the effect uh, from a value perspective of uh, lowering the tax rates, you get less of a deple depletion and depreciation bonus. Uh, what what people ask me is, well, uh, what's it going to do overall? Does it make us uh, more valuable or less? Well, uh, if, if pre-tax, and, and this is just on an example, pre-tax valuation was about 31.4 million pre-2018. Uh, post-tax value about 27 million, and the 2018 and onward post-tax value is about 30.5. So, really, what's what's happened? Once you figure in the depletion and depreciation effect, it and a lowered tax rate, it almost comes back to the pre-tax value, which is you know pretty interesting. So, we have another polling question here, um, Emily. All right, our second polling question. The most important step when valuing oil and gas reserves is estimating the discount rate, estimation of price, estimation of production and reserves, or 
all are equally important. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We are on our second question. And let's take a look at the results. Kim, back to you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, interesting respondents. Uh, most important step, estimating the discount rate, estimating the price, or estimating the production and reserves. Uh, most, most respondents said all are equally important. Actually, uh, statistically, the estimation of production and reserves is the most important part and drives the most, uh, the biggest part of the value here. I could change the discount rate uh, one or two percent, and it won't make as big a difference as if I change the reserve future reserve profile. Okay, so uh, we're we're nearing time on this. Uh, just so so I'll I'll move on a little quicker. This is uh, the transaction approach, and I think we've. Uh, may have beaten that sufficiently, but that's that's the steps that are gone through improving transactions. And again, this is very important for internal revenue service work. When you're doing IRS, you want to support it with a transaction approach because if you are audited, they're going to ask why it was never performed. This on the Delaware base, and I'll give everybody a chance to look at it for a second. And this is just through October. It didn't include a couple of the uh, more recent deals that uh, that were huge, as we all know. But those metrics are pretty well aligned with uh, uh, most of the deals. When you know, it's like a statistics professor said. He said, if you get a, uh, uh, a population of 33 or more, you're going to get a normal distribution. So, at 92 transactions, there's acreage value. And uh, total transaction analysis of a particular deal it happened to be a, a Gulf Coast deal. Uh, the median reserves were right at nine dollars a BOE, and then a reconciliation. And uh, uh, the numbers on top you're looking at are based on. Uh, discounted cash flow analysis. You'll see the estimated fair value of the PDP and the PDNP and, and the PUDs here, and uh, a fair amount, as, as you see, to uh, the probables. Uh, we risk those at 50%, as well as various riskings of the CapEx and OpEx. And, but then coming down and uh, reconciling that to uh, the transactions is an important step for IRS purposes. And you'll see that uh, analysis below the fair value of the reserves, kind of in the lower middle of the page. Okay, we've got another question. Emily? All right. Our third question. Uh, so true or false, a pre-tax discount rate is typically lower than a post-tax discount rate. So if that's true or false, and for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says Slide Deck and Handouts to the right of the slide view. Uh, we will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. Give everyone a few more moments to think about this. And we'll take a look at the results. Jim, back to you. A hey, pre-tax discount rate is usually lower than a post-tax discount rate. Uh, no, it's usually higher because uh, the tax has been taken out of the, the, the cost of tax. So uh, in, in the calculation of the, of the uh, tax rate and the, the debt, I'll say, it is one minus the tax rate as opposed to uh, no tax. So you're 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 almost always well. You will have a lower discount rate post tax than you will pre tax. Okay, the the 
effective increase in depreciable versus depletable. Uh, the IRS usually allows a rule of thumb of 10 to 15 percent of the deal value to be placed into depreciable assets. Uh, the, the higher up the scale, the higher percentage, the additional tax yield you're going to get over the first seven years, which is that depreciable life of that asset. So an example I give, moving depreciable from 10 to 30% in a $100 million deal uh, provides an undiscounted five-year shield of about $2.5, $2.6 million, assuming a 30-year reserve life and 21% tax rate. Now, obviously, it was a greater effect when tax rate was 39.6 on these C-Corps. And <clears throat> one, one thing I want to say as well, uh, the... LLCs uh, is somewhere somewhere up the the food chain and are going to be issued owners are going to be issued a K1 and now their tax rate unless they're structured as a C corp uh, went down a couple of percent it was 39 I think 0.6 and uh, moved down to 37 percent so the the effects aren't going to change that much for an LLC and I strongly suggest if you have questions about that to call uh, <clears throat> one of the many Moss Adams uh, tax people, partners, senior managers, and, and they're very well versed on this and can go into a lot more detail of, of what that effect would be. Okay, so this is a couple of tables about how moving that uh, depreciable life, that's a product that uh, we I actually developed and uh, to value out the categories that the IRS deems as uh, uh, depreciable assets. And to increase that, I've done about 25 of those in my career on deals up to a couple of $3 billion and down to less than $100 million and have never been challenged by the IRS in doing this. And it creates a really nice tax shield. So uh, <clears throat> this page and the next are more about the uh, buyer's perspective more to tangible property because they get the depreciation on that or the bonus depreciation on that used equipment. And from the seller's perspective, they want to minimize recapture. And so they would have less to the tangible property. And again, going back to the uh, purchase sale agreement, the 8594 election is typically agreed on by both buyer and seller. And uh, there's Oftentimes, a lot of pushback. Some quick examples of production rods to, uh, of tangible equipment that's depreciable. Um, you guys know what all this is. Pumping units, downhole tubing pumps, et cetera, et cetera. Christmas trees, pipelines, flow lines, tanks, rods, tubing, certain casing, uh, dirt work, roads, pipelines, and construction costs. Again, when does the IRS, uh, do they require a third-party valuation? Uh, they don't necessarily say they require a third-party valuation, but I, I can say it's very, very helpful. A good percentage of the valuations we perform are because upcoming audits or uh, uh, the, the client knows that at some point he or, or ownership will be audited and a third-party Evaluation is, is the best defense against it. Going through a qualified appraiser, how they look at it, they, they like the big designations and the experience. These are some of the things the IRS actually has a, um, a pretty extensive checklist on what the reports must look like. And uh, you know, they, they again, like I was talking about the Internal Revenue Manual that this is out of, or a lot of it's out of, uh, they, they like a checklist and that all the, all the boxes have been ticked off in evaluation report. Okay, one more polling question here. All right, final polling question. Is there a reason to allocate purchase price between reserves and leasehold equipment? And your options are yes, no, or I don't know. 
And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification widget to the right of the slide view. And this is our final polling question for today. I'll give everyone a few more moments to make a selection. And let's take a look at the results. Jim, back to you. All right, well, all, all but 2% of the people uh, got this right. <laughs> and, and the answer is, is yes, there is a reason. Uh, one is it's uh, the IRS tells you you must in that um, statute, and uh, as well for your for for tax purposes, the depreciation versus de the depreciable versus the depletable assets make a difference and can make a very big difference. All right, some of the state tax considerations. Uh, again, it would be helpful uh, uh, to, if, if, if you have some real detailed questions about this and how it could affect the, uh, your current assets or prospective assets you're looking to, I would, I would contact a Moss Adams uh, tax person. And we have uh, state and local tax partners and managers uh, in Texas, Colorado, and, and elsewhere. They can walk you through this, but I, I, what this is hitting on mainly is Oklahoma is now aggressively challenging taxpayer valuations for state sales tax if it does not match the value assigned for federal tax purposes. In other words, the state of Oklahoma is going to look at that 8594 and your 1060 allocation and say, well, you know, uh, we we think you need to pay a fair amount of tax on the equipment that transferred. And I believe that's sales tax. So don't, uh, don't hesitate to call one of our offices and talk to somebody about this matter. Well, that about wraps it up on my end, everybody. And if you have any questions in Q&A, we can uh, attempt to answer those now. All right. Uh, if you have any questions for Jim, you can enter those in the Q&A box below the slide view. And we have time for one or two here. Uh, we'll start with, does the lower tax rate always make the value higher? Well, the, the answer to that, Emily, is uh, uh, typically it would. Uh, even even with the uh, depletable and depreciable uh, benefits you would receive, uh, <clears throat> you're you're actually going to have a uh, a higher value when the tax rate goes down because of the effect on the cost of capital. All right. Our next question: Do the Reserve Report PV10 numbers include federal taxes? Uh, the answer to that is uh, no. Uh, nearly all the reserve reports we, we see and work with the reserve firms are pre-tax and do not include the depreciable and depletable benefits of post-tax analysis. All right, we can probably squeeze in one more question here. Uh, is PV10 in oil and gas reserve reports a good proxy for fair market value? Well, no, it's not. And uh, earlier in the talk, I showed uh, uh, the weighted average cost of capital for some very large independent oil and gas companies. The reality of it is when you start going, uh, I'll say downstream into companies, and by downstream, I mean smaller companies, their cost of capital can be a whole lot uh, higher than that. We see, uh, we see some companies approach uh, 18 and 20 percent, and that's before any risk is added uh, to the profile for, of, of, of the actual reserves or assets they're buying. And that could be, like I said, operational risk, it could be uh, mechanical risk, or just your reserve risk. <clears throat> uh, 
one other thing. I, I got a question here, Emily, a transaction approach. How are companies looking at oil production reserve versus gas production reserves? And I, I think the answer to that is obviously, uh, you know, the backwardation in gas right now uh, hasn't created quite the upside, obviously, that oil has and, and the enthusiasm of oil uh, jumping across the $60 fence and now uh, with, with the $70 uh, uh, ceiling there. Uh, gas has, I don't want to use the word languished, but uh, it hasn't received as much attention. That said, at an SPE meeting last night, the presentation was about LNG, and and <clears throat> I hate to use the word, but when if, <laughs> when these gas liquef liquefaction facilities come online, uh, there will be a, a price shift in natural gas, and it's not too far around the corner. All right. That is just about all we have time for right at the top of the hour here. Uh, thank you, Jim, for a great presentation today. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to Thank an online survey. Much. Thank you, Jim. Thank Here's you. a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.